Now, obviously, being a big part, big part of your role currently is is within the media and on across lots of different platforms. You're probably therefore pretty well placed to make comment on the way you see the media, particularly, uh, who obviously aren't always experts, influencing the way we make those health decisions. The most relevant one at the moment is whether we get vaccinated or not. What are you seeing and what, what sort of um, influence do you think the media is having on, on that role, on that, um, those decisions that we're making? I, th I think the, um, I'm biased, of course, because I'm a member of the media, but, you know, I could always slag off at my colleagues, but we actually have quite a high standard of, of journalism in Australia. I know we all enjoy watching Media Watch and poll, Barry, having a go at, at, at people, but we actually have a reasonably high standard in Australia. We don't sink to the tabloid death, de depths of the United Kingdom or the United States. Um, you know, we don't have pointy-headed Martians arriving and, you know, changing our lives. We never sink to that sort of depth, so it's not that bad. So what, uh, I'll, I'll come back to the vaccination in a minute, but I'll talk, uh, what, I, what I do talk about in the book are words that drive me nuts, and it's more commercial interests that drive this, I think, than the media itself. It's more the ads in between what we do in the media than else. So one thing that drives me nuts is the wellness industry. And um, so I have my least favourite words that I have a go at in the book. Resilience is another one. Um, in other words, insomnia is another one. We'll come, we can come to those later in the chat. But wellness. So not well-being. I think well-being is a valid concept and an important thing for us to strive for. But this wellness concept, which is that there's something that we sh we're taught, there's something that we're taught again and again by, what the, by advertising, there's something we should be aspiring to. So if you're a bloke, you jump out of bed in the morning and you go to the sink to wash your teeth and you admire your six pack and your perfect children walk in. And if you're a woman, you jump out of bed full of energy, admiring your thin thighs and, uh, and again, your perfect kids. When most of us, when we get up most mornings, we don't want to get up. We feel lousy. We've got a pain in our shoulder because we put too much exercise with that arm yesterday. Um, you know, we crawl to the sink and think, oh God, is that what I look like? And we actually, how do you know that you're well? If you were, if you were like that image that we're given by, by commerce in a sense, commercial interest in promoting wellness, whatever thing that they're promoting today, today is, if you felt like that every day, you actually wouldn't know what it's like to feel well because you get nothing to measure it against. That's just normal for you. We know when we feel well, when we feel great, because life is a cycle and we're up and down. One day we feel lousy and another day we feel great. And the other thing that happens is that we medicalize stuff that shouldn't be medicalized. And, um, and so this is not a medical book. If you're wanting a book about diabetes and heart disease or dementia or something, don't buy this book. Buy, buy a book on diabetes, heart disease or dementia. This is about health. This is about living well. And this is about living well according to your own criteria. And so, the, so we, we, we tend to medicalize unwellness. Now, when this feeling lousy in the morning becomes a problem is when it's every morning and you've lost motivation. You don't enjoy the things that you used to. It's hard to motivate yourself. That's when it becomes a problem that you seek help. But that normal waxing and waning is normal. It's normal to have pain. If you actually think about yourself at the moment, and you're, you can't focus, most of us feel pain at any one time. I, if I think hard about it, there's something that's sore, but most of the time I actually don't think about it, not because I'm a strong person. So that's, that's you know, the wellness thing. And, um, and, and I think that we are conditioned into thinking there's some, there's some imaginary perfection that we should be aiming for. And if we're not achieving it, there's something missing in our lives when it's normal. And, and sleep, everybody is obsessed with sleep at the moment. I'm not getting eight hours sleep a night. So, I mean, another driver for the book is I keep on coming across people in the audience, my audience or wherever else, who are anxious about things about their health that they don't need to be anxious about. So one of the biggest things people are anxious about is sleep. Oh, I've been told I need to get seven or eight hours sleep a night. I'm not getting seven or eight sleep hours a night. I'm going to get dementia. I've been told I'm going to get dementia. But the evidence for seven or eight hours sleep is just an average. Um, and some people just only sleep five or six hours a night. Now, 
if you line up 100 people and ask how many hours you sleep a night, and then ask them whether there's insomnia, they've got insomnia, you'll find two people standing side by side, one of whom says they've got insomnia, one of whom says they, they're fine, and they both sleep the same amount. It's, it's perception. Also, are you feeling lousy in the morning, all the time you're feeling tired during the day, then you've got a problem, but not just because you're only sleeping five or six hours. And the interesting thing is that when you get the best sleep therapy, you know, the, and I talk about the best sleep therapy in the book, um, it actually doesn't turn a five or six hour a night sleeper into an eight hour an hour sleeper. It just gives you an unbroken night's sleep of five or six hours, which gives the lie in a sense to the fact that we're all gonna strive for seven or eight hours and you're gonna get dementia if you don't, you don't get there. Um, so it, 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 it's trying to demedicalize that and create and tell you what's normal, you don't need to worry about, it. and then look at what actually gets you to a better place than you are now. So sticking on the wellness theme then, you, your book does talk a little bit about what are some of the indicators for a middle-aged person as to whether they're going to end up being a sprightly, fit and healthy person in their mid-80s. So I think... I call them the exceptional survivor. Yes. Can you talk us through what are some of those indicators that we should be aspiring to, if there's any difference for men and women, but what are we looking for that might indicate we're going to be right when we're in our mid-80s? Yeah. So an exceptional survivor is somebody who's, let's say, in their mid-80s. They hardly ever go to see the GP. They're as bright as a button. Their mind's sharp. They're fit and healthy. How, how exactly is your question, Robin? How, how have they got there? Hmm. And what they've done is they've got longitudinal studies, studies where they follow populations through to age 85, seen them at 85, found their exceptional survivors, then they've looked at their records to see what they were like, say when they're about 55. So at 55, uh, people who are destined to be exceptional survivors are not are non-smokers. Okay. They are people who are not too thin, not too fat, you know, the Goldilocks, so that you're allowed to be a little bit just a touch overweight at 55. And they are people who have got normal blood pressure. Now that doesn't mean you have, that, that, that includes people who have normal blood pressure because they're taking drugs for blood pressure. That's okay. So if you're, as long as your blood pressure is normal, it doesn't matter how you got there, it, 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 it's normal blood pressure. They're getting exercise and you know, they've got a good cholesterol level. And if you're a man, you're married. Check. And if you're a woman, you're not ripped off and every woman listening to us watching us now knows exactly what <laughs> i'm talking about here you don't um, have to explain why we get it no <laughs> yeah, i'll probably have to explain to the blokes um who are um yeah but, but. so what, how do you think um our local gps would cope then if we rocked along we rock along now if we're unwell we go go to our doctors to talk about illness if we went in to talk about wellness and said nothing wrong with me doc I'm just here to talk about wellness how well prepared do you think that doctors and other health professionals are for those conversations and and to support us to navigate to wellness well I think is well-being is what you should talk about yeah and what I talk about in the book is being good enough not fantastic but just being good enough there was uh, there was a book about uh, child rearing and child psychology um by Don Don Winnicott who um um, who was a famous uh, pediatric pediatrician, developmental pediatrician and psychiatrist. And he talks about the good enough parent. You know, you don't, don't have to be fantastic. You just got to be good enough in life and, and well-being. And I think the conversation with GPs is, um, is changing. And I think that um, GPs get a bit anxious about this because they haven't been taught very much about well-being. Mm. They've been taught a lot about illness. Yep. I'm going to give you my own example. I trained in pediatrics and I really enjoyed neonatal pediatrics, newborn pediatrics. And when you've done a few stints in newborn pediatrics, when you're the pediatric registrar on call and you get called to all the difficult deliveries. So that the baby needs to resuscitate it. You're there to take the baby and resuscitate the baby. But after a while of doing this, you start to think there's no such thing as a normal delivery mm. because the only deliveries you see are the abnormal ones, the problem, the problematic ones. And so it is when you're a doctor, you tend to, you're, even though you know you're not seeing a representative sample of the world, you, you, you know, everything looks like disease and illness and so on. So many GPs, I, I'm sure, welcome a discussion about well-being, but they get a bit anxious about it because they've not been well, 
well trained in it. But I think what the new breed of GPs has been taught is not to, to make, and it's a pretty much this, I've never been a GP, too hard a job, I mean, much easier being in pediatrics and focusing on the narrow, GP's gonna know everything about everything. Um, but what, what they're increasingly taught is not to make assumptions about the person who's walked into your surgery and to actually ask them what they're wanting out of this consultation. Mm. So that the patient is in the driver's seat because what doctors have learned the hard way is you jump to the conclusion and you may actually come to the wrong diagnosis because you've come to the wrong conclusion, but you may do what you think is the right thing by the person, but it's not what they want and not what they want to achieve out of the consultation. So that you let the person, which is the people watching this conversation, drive it and work out what's wanted. And what the research has shown is that the consultation is often shorter, it's more effective and efficient, the patient is happier at the end of it, and, um, and, you, 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 and the doctor is more satisfied with it as well. And the, you know, and if, so, so in other words, um, for example, some, somebody may have cancer, but what they, what they're not that, they know that their time might be limited, which is actually less and less true of most cancers these days, but let's assume they know the time is limited. Um, this is probably more for a conversation with their oncologist than the GP, but the GP can often be a, a medium, a, 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 an intermediary here, which is actually what I want is to feel really well for the time I've got left. And what we know actually, when you know, even if it, you know you've got two years left or three years left, what we know is that if you actually enter palliative care early, so that it's not like something a month before you die, but it could be two years, you know, you don't even know what, where you're going. And they, they actually deal with symptom control and you're not on intensive treatment. People actually live longer. Mm. You live longer on palliative care because your well-being is higher. And a lot of this stuff feels soft. You know, when I say soft, not hard science. And what I talk about in the book is not that particular story. I mean, that's, that, that's not in the book. But what I, I talk, talk about in the book is that we forget easily that our mind and our body are the one thing. Mm. We tend to think our mind is something else, somewhere else. And we, we you kind of know what I've just said is true, but the way we behave, and you include me in this, you know, I often, you often behave as though your mind is somewhere else and your body is somewhere else. You know, going back to the GP consultation, we get, we get angry with our GP. If we've got pain, say chronic pain, and the doctor raises the issue as you're a bit depressed, you're really angry with the doctor because you think, oh, the doctor is saying that it's all in my mind, which is not what the doctor is saying. The doctor is saying, if you're feeling depressed, it's actually having an influence on your pain. If we deal with that, your pain might actually improve. It's not cause and effect. But I mean, so what happens in our bodies affects our brain and our mind. What happens in our mind affects our bodies, our mood, the way we experience the environment, our relationships, um, what we eat, how we eat, where we eat how we grow what we eat, how we cook, all affects our mind and our body. And this is not some left-wing pinko soft idea. This is solid science. And I quote the science in the book. Um, Professor, the late Professor Bruce McEwen at Rockefeller University, a university in New York with about 14 Nobel Prizes to its name, um, has studied this. And, when you, and your mood, the effect, the, the, the chronic stress you might be under, affects how your body works and how you feel. And so um, that sense of well-being that we might talk about in terms of um, actually is, is actually health giving to your body. And one shouldn't be surprised about that. And so what, how your mental, not your mental attitude, by the way, that's often, um, that's often something that's used as a weapon rather than something rather than anything else in this in this conversation. But you know, exercise, diet, the, all those things have a complicated effect on the body. You mentioned Nobel Prize winners. You do reference in your book the first Australian woman to win a Nobel Prize, Elizabeth Elizabeth Blackburn, and her work on uh, pioneering work on us better understanding telomeres. Now. I'm going to open up and then you're going to have to take over here um, because I'll probably butcher this. But the way I, I read it in your book is that uh, stress can actually affect our DNA. 
and it does so through its impact on telomeres, which are the like the tiny little plastic bits at the end of a, a shoelace that stop it from fraying. There's a similar thing on our chromosomes, and that can be impacted by stress. If that occurs, is that something then that's irreversible, that it, it, it has an impact on our health and stress has an impact on our health at the time? But is, it, is it the gift that keeps on giving or is it is something that is reversible over time? So a very good explanation, you know, top of the class. Um, so these telomeres do, they're effectively there to hold our chromosomes together. Right. The longer they are, the better they are. And shortening is actually a reflection of aging, but also puts you at risk of diseases like cancer and other things as well. And yes, she's shown that adversity, disadvantage, um, toxins in the environment, other things shorten your telomeres. So every time your cell multiplies, it changes, it sort of divides, your telomeres shorten a little bit. So it's almost like a clock. Um, but yes, she's shown that you can actually reverse that and, um, and you can, or you can at least slow it down and halt it. Um, the, uh, the, the length of your telomeres. And that's another example of how the external environment, the psychology and the stress you're talking about is not the acute stress of going on the ride of death at the local fun park. Um, fun in inverted commas, I hate rides of death. But anyway, um, I do talk about that in the book as well, by the way, um, is, the, um, is the chronic stress where you do not feel that you have the ability to make decisions over your life that somehow your life is controlled by something over there. Psych psychologists call this the locus of control. Mm -hmm. Another word for it is agency. How much agency do you feel you have to actually control your life and make decisions? So if you're working in a job, middle management, you've got a lousy boss who micromanages you, tells you what to do, doesn't give you latitude there, that's a very unhealthy experience. And that creates this chronic stress, which influences your body, can shorten your life, can change the way your immune system works. And that's the work of Bruce McEwen and also Michael Marmot at uh, University College London, an expatriate Australian researcher, em very eminent one. And, um, and it's this sense of control that you have in your life is really important. Another manifestation of that is if you're a single parent with three kids on a pension. Mm -hmm. The locus of control is over there. You know, it's, it's in poverty. It's in, you've just got no ability to make decisions about your life. Some people who have cancer experience it. There have been studies of women with breast cancer, where after only a few weeks of having breast cancer, your locus of control has left here and gone over there because the oncologists have it and the cancer, the cancer team have it. They're not intending to take it away from you. And bringing that back to you, that locus of control, is one of the most helpful things that you can do for your life. It's very hard to change your life, to eat in new ways, to exercise in new ways, if you're not if you're not centered in that in that sense of control of your life so when i start at the beginning of the book i set these concepts up yep. not as some you know hippie thing from the north coast of new south wales but as a sense of solid physiology where the mind and the body are one this locus of control has to come back to you and if you've got that you've got the ability to actually make decisions and do stuff in your life 